Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you an exciting dramatization of an unforgettable story on the Hallmark Playhouse. Tonight's story was chosen from the whole world of fiction by one of the world's most popular authors, whose knowledge of stories that will entertain you and stir your imagination is universally recognized. Hallmark is proud to present the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight on the Hallmark Playhouse, we offer for the first time on the air a dramatization of a story which captured my fancy rather neatly when I first read it. It's called Girls Are Like Boats, and it's by Charles Rawlings. And because we all liked it so much, we thought it quite a good idea to talk to Mr. Rawlings himself about it. So we finally located him in a small village in the state of Maine. And we found, as we guessed, that he was something of an expert about boats. Perhaps when you heard girls are like boats, you'll wonder if he was equally an expert about girls. Anyhow, he still says they're like boats. So let's leave it at that, especially since his story has two heroines, a girl and a boat. And our hero was emotionally involved with both of them. Mr. Rawlings also told us he had raced many boats himself, both on Lake Ontario and Long Island Sound. However, the main thing is, as I think you'll agree when the program is over, that he can weave a yarn as smartly as he can trim a mainsail. But before we begin, a few words from Frank Goss. I'd just like to remind you that there are hallmark cards for any memorable occasion you can think of. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, there is a hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And those three identifying words on the back. A hallmark card. Well, they say you cared enough to send the very best. Thank you, Mr. Hilton, and now it's all yours. The moment George saw her, it was that most exciting cliche of life under popular literature, love at first sight. She was slim and graceful, impudent, smart, and indescribably beautiful. But let George tell it. It was his affair. George? Like you say, Mr. Hilton, love at first sight. My ventricles went pity and my oracles went pat. She was class all over, and every inch a lady. And there was 30 feet of her, and she didn't weigh an ounce over seven tons. She was a dream boat. Her decks were robin's egg blue, her woodwork was teak wood, polished like black glass. Ah, she was a charmer, built for speed. There was only one thing wrong with her. The minx just wouldn't sail. The cotton blossom wouldn't win a race. Everyone tried. Everyone gave up. Until finally they hauled her out of the water in disgrace. There she sat all through the fall and winter and into the spring. When lo and what have you, there she was afloat again at her old berth. And men working all over her. A little man with horn-rimmed spectacles was watching her the way a cat watches its firstborn absorb its first mouse. Well, hello there. Not the cotton blossom. Yeah, she's her. I've, uh, I've seen you around the yacht club, haven't I? I come around Sunday afternoon. That's right. Uh, you and your wife, I believe. Yeah, sort of tall woman. Yeah. Wide and bush. I remember. Twice my size. Uh, yeah. yeah. Lassie, Lassie Doolittle. I- I'm Pete Doolittle. I'm George Bemis. I'm on the racing committee. How are you, Doolittle? Racing committee, huh? Uh-huh. Well, mister, you chaps in the R-boats are going to have something to beat this year. Not the cotton blossom. Uh, I just bought it. No. I'm just getting back in. It's my sport, you know. Uh, are you a yachtsman? Why not? Uh, nothing, nothing. Oh, I know. You, you think I'm just a squeaky little guy with shell room glasses and a broken down hat and the word taxpayer written across my coattails like in the cartoons, huh? I look like the funny pictures of John Public, I know. Or maybe Barney Google. Oh, no. No, you don't. Oh, I do, too. Yes, I do. I do. But not when I'm sailing. 
Well, we're glad somebody took an interest in the cotton blossom. We want to see her go. Oh, she'll go. Oh, she'll go if I have to give her the hot foot. That's the talk. Well, it isn't just talk. Well, our first club race is Saturday. I'll be in the yard dead at 36-footer. Well, I'll be in the cotton blossom, so watch out. You just watch out for Pete Doolittle, the little guy in the cartoon. <laughs> It was a cold, raw day, and we got a white squall two minutes before our starting gun. And pretty soon I lost track of the cotton blossom. But when I had a minute to look around, hanged if she wasn't in a good berth up to the weather. Then I got very busy again. And when I could look around again, she was up in the wind, very close alongside us with her crew hauling down the mainsail. And she was in trouble. Her mast, cracked at the deck line, was leaning like a bent sapling. And Pete Doolittle was standing up in the cockpit screaming at the whole world. <laughs> Was that little fellow indignant? I thought so. I thought so. A spoiled society boat. Blue deck. A sail locker like a hope chest. Ahoy, Cotton Blossom. Can we help you? Pettit, baby, Cotton. No, you can't help it. Mast off in the bills. Give her a first real chance and she cracks her mast. How'd it happen, Doolittle? You were doing great. Oh, I had to do it. She's got to face the facts of life. I'll take her down. I'll show her. I'll get a race out of her. Ah, relax, Pete, relax. I'll make her go. I'll kick her in the slats. That's what I'll do. All right, you men, get that Mm. canvas off. Maybe the little guy's right. Maybe that's the way to handle temperamental females like the cotton blossom. Maybe so. I thought you might like coming down here for a little talk in my boat, Pete. Ah, it's a nice little boat. It's ship shape. Have a drink of something? Um, uh, root beer. I just happened to have a bottle I bought in 1929. Ah, there she is. Ah, the blossom should have taken that squall. Oh, still brooding about the cracked mast? She's a good boat, but they babied her. Tuned it at that. I'll drown your rage in root beer. She's all laced up. That, that spar should never have broken. But I'll teach her. I'll get her. If I live long enough. Hey, uh, root beer. Oh, thanks, thanks. What do you mean, if you live long enough? Well, I promised my wife when we were married that I'd never race again. Backslider, huh? Well, I just had to get back to the boats. Sea fever. I must go down to the seas again to the lonely sea in the sky. That's right. Where'd you sail before? Oh, skiffs, dinghies. Really? Where? Oh, we raced on the Thames once. We beat the Royal Norfolk and Suffolk in a four-boat team series. Really? Mm-hmm. I won the skiff championship at Alexandria Bay. What championship was that? The national. The national? Oh, well, that was years ago. Pete, on behalf of the Middle Long Island Sound Yacht Association, of which I am race committeeman, welcome home. <laughs> Come in. I said come in. You wouldn't drown yourself out like you that. You are you... Mr. George Bemis? Uh, yes, ma'am. On the race committee of this yacht club? I am. I presume you're in this piece of treachery with Peter. Treachery? Peter? Look, I don't... Ah, don't deny it. You've been encouraging him about that miserable sailboat he bought here. Oh. Yes, oh. I found out, you see... Why, I ought to break every bone in your body. How much do such things cost? Boats or damage suits? Peter's bank statement shows that he withdrew $4,000 three weeks ago. Well, there's your answer, then. Now, you listen to me, young man. Mm -hmm. I am not going to have it. I had my reasons when I made Peter promise me not to race again. He's a very nervous man. Uh Uh-huh. Racing makes him dream at night. Why, it was a full year after we were married before he stopped being profane in his sleep. Now he started again. The sea, madam, is a hard master, madam. Do you I... drink? Uh, well, uh, I take a little cooking whiskey on cold, rainy nights. <laughs> oh, those boats are floating bar rooms. Mm. I happen to be an organizer of women. I hold several committee posts of importance. Why, to have my husband publicized on the sporting pages... Reeking of sweat and alcohol yes. and liniments. Ah, yes, dear lady, I understand utterly. Peter is a good man. For 25 years, we've lived happily together. Mm-hmm. This demoralizing foolishness is therefore something I will not have. I am not going to have it. Stout girl. Not 
for my height and build. Good day, Mr. Beavis. Too little. Oh, there you are. Oh, hi, you, George. What's on your nautical mind? I've just been scrimmaging with the forward wall of the Green Bay Packers. Huh? Yeah, a lady who keeps on shrieking she will not have it. Oh, dear, my wife. Uh huh. I just spoke to her. No one ever speaks to my wife. Now, you just listen. Now, you listen, Pete. You've raced some good races for us, and you've raced some bad ones. Well, the bad ones are because I keep on worrying that my wife will find out. Well, you can stop worrying. She has found out. Oh, dear. It seems you've you've started swearing in your sleep again. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Pete, tonight you're going home to the crisis of your life. But there's one thing you've got to promise me. Mm. You're not going to quit racing. Now, promise. Well, suppose she murders me. Well, tell her we'll never have a drop of liquor aboard. Tell her her you'll be home Saturday and Sunday night. Anything she wants, give it to her. But you can't stop sailing. Oh, dear me, dear me. Rough language isn't going to save you. Now, you come with me. Oh, where? To the back room. I want to talk to you. Now, come on. Now. Oh, dear. Doolittle, why don't you try to feel as tough and uncompromising as you felt that day when you pulled the mast out of the cotton blossom? Well, what am I going to do? I, the lassie's twice my size. Oh, yes. Why is it that Providence gives such great gifts to timid little men? Well, she's no gift. No, no, no. I mean your gift of seamanship. Oh. You know, you sure don't look like a great sailor, but you are. Well, look at Napoleon. Now, he was little. Napoleon's dead. Well, I think I can match that. <laughs> you have this great gift and you don't know what to do with it. Well, Lassie will tell me what I can do with it. Pete, promise me you won't weaken. When was I strong? You. You, Peter Doolittle, you're a sailor. Yours is the heritage of the Vikings, of Columbus, of the seafaring Phoenicians. Well, I... I call upon you to think of the men who have fought and conquered the sea before you. You, Doolittle, you're one of them. Me? They are your brethren. Uh, yeah? Think of the great heroes of the sea. Think of the Seahawks. Drake, Frobisher, Hawkins, sailing their Elizabethan thunderbolts to eternal glory. Think. Yeah, yeah. And the bounty. Think of the epic of the bounty of old Ironsides, the Alabama. That's right. And the Mayflower. What about the Mayflower? Yeah, yeah, yeah. what about Henry Hudson and and, and the Half Moon? Farragut in the Mississippi. Damn the torpedoes. Full speed ahead. Hurry on Lake Erie. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Captain Lawrence and the Chesapeake. Don't give up the ship. Add up, boy, Pete. And what about John Macefield, court laureate of England? And sea fever, huh? I must go down to the seas again. To the lonely sea in the sky. And do it, do it. And all I ask is a tall ship. The cotton blossom. Start Tall ship, a cotton blossom, starred a stirrer by. Had a boy, Pete, fast, put the wind for France. Columbia, Pete. yeah, had a boy, Pete. Had a boy. Get out of my way. I'll probably get killed, but I'm off to the war. And if anything goes wrong, don't you worry. We'll bury him at sea. <laughs> You are listening to a dramatization of Girls Are Like Boats on the Hallmark Playhouse, a story selected for you by the distinguished novelist James Hilton. Before Mr. Hilton introduces the second act, I'd like to introduce a great Italian sculptor of two centuries ago. His name was Antonio Canova, and his studio was a monk's cell. One day, a friend came visiting and burst into praise of an apparently completed statue. But Canova calmly continued to make minute refinements with what seemed to be trivial taps of his mallet. And when the visitor chided him for wasting time on such small details, the sculptor replied, These final touches make the difference between failure and perfection. Yes, whether it's a statue or a greeting card, it's the extra touches, the small refinements that make the difference. And the folks who make Hallmark cards know just how to give their greeting cards that extra something that you and your friends will most appreciate. You see, they're not making just cards. They're creating Hallmark cards. Greeting cards that go out of their way to be warm and friendly and sincere. Cards that have a wonderful way of saying just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. That's why Hallmark cards are America's favorite greeting cards. And that's why those three identifying words on the back, a Hallmark card, tell your friends you've cared enough to send the very best. 
Now, James Hilton, the famous writer who selects the stories for the Hallmark Playhouse, takes you back to Girls Are Like Boats. <laughs> So here we are with Peter Doolittle in quite a serious dilemma for anyone like Pete, who takes his boating seriously. Well, Mr. Rawlings got him into it. Maybe he can get him out of it. Because, as I said before, he can weave a yarn as smartly as he can trim a mainsail. So let's see how he does it. He has Pete's wife talk to the Commodore of the Yacht Club. She pretends to have a nervous breakdown. She advertises cotton broken for sale. At her own puppy, she speaks firmly against Yacht Club. Yackety, 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 yackety. Week after week after week, it wore Pete down. But somehow he never quite gave in. But it was hurting his racing form. And George finally had to speak to Pete about it. Pete, life's just not worth living to you, is it? Not very nice. Want to quit? Well, the only happiness I have is racing my boat. If I quit, I won't have anything. No, I blame your wife. She's a... What is? Oh, now we ought not to talk like that, George. Well, she isn't so bad. Well, not so awful bad. What that woman needs is what you said the cotton blossom needed once, and you were dead right. Rough handling occasionally. Discipline. Women are like boats. Yeah, they got to be paddled every so often. Women are like boats, all sizes, all shapes, all temperaments. And full of bilge. They're like boats, and they've got to be treated like boats. You took the cotton blossom and actually wrestled the performance out of it. Oh, well, she's a great boat. Yes, she's a great boat. But since you've been fighting your wife on this issue, I've gotten only two good races out of you. I know. Nothing you can do about it? I have met the enemy, and I am pooed. Well, in that case, Pete, I, I'm afraid I've got bad news for you. We picked the boat that's to race against Montaigne's dandelion up at Lodgecrest. Oh, the Ardette, I suppose. No, the Cotton Blossom. The Cotton Blossom? Oh, you call that now, bad news? wait a minute, news? Pete, wait a minute. I, I tried to get the race committee to let you sail us, and she's your boat. Well, she is my boat. Pete, the club comes first. Now, you know that. And they, well, to put it bluntly, they... Just couldn't see a hen-pecked husband in the role of a winner, a victorious hero. You mean I'm not going to sail it? Nope. That youngster, Parks, is going to sail the Cotton Blossom. Oh, no. I'm sorry, Pete. You're sorry? I'll never race again. I wouldn't say that, Pete. Well, I am saying it. I'm going right home. I'm going to promise Lassie I'll never race a yacht again. Well, well I'll, I'll, I'll send you my letter... Resignation. When I, when, when I can get around to. Up at Lodge Crest, they fly the bunting and swish the brass polishing rags when you come up to race. Monty, their champion, was wearing a snow white polo coat that year. Fox and the Cotton Blossom made all the right motions, and by. A miracle of some kind, we took the first race. But it didn't mean anything. Fox was sailing better than he knew how and had a reputation for blowing up. The next day, Fox blew up. We lost by two and a half minutes. Wet, shivering, and unnerved, Fox stepped into the dinghy to take him ashore and slipped, dislocated his shoulder. The next morning, he couldn't move his arm. Ah, that day was perfect for racing. No chance for a postponement. So I got the sailing secretary of our own club on the phone, and I said, deliver this message for me in your official capacity, will you? Just get Pete Doolittle the news, and I want him right away. Tell Pete that George wants it. He'll understand. Don't fail me. Get going now. Good morning. Peter Doolittle speaking. Who? Secretary's... Yeah? George? George Bemis wants me right away. I see. Yeah, oh, I get it. Sure, here I come. Oh, thanks. Oh, boy. No, you don't, Peter. Lassie. Oh, please. No, I, I gotta go someplace. It's very important. In your long underwear? Oh, uh, where are my clothes? Downstairs. Oh, what are they doing downstairs? I hid them. 
I knew something like this might happen in spite of your promise to me never to race again. I want my clothes. Now, where's my pants? Now, look, before I get incensed... I wear the pants in this family. Yeah, and you, you look like carnation in them, too. And you look very fetching in that union suit. Oh, I can't sail a boat in this. Why not? One of your heroes, Commodore Farragut, in the Civil War, sailed his boat in a union suit. Yeah... Yeah, and you know what Farragut said, don't you? Oh, Peter Doolittle, don't you dare swear and call me a torpedo. All right, then, just full speed ahead. And out of my way, woman. Who are you screaming at? The blood of the Seahawks beats in my veins. The blood of the Seahawks will be all over the rug if you don't watch out, Doolittle. Now get back in the bed and stay there. Now, where do you think you're going? Come back. Hey. Hey. Oh, Lassie. Unlock this door at once, Lassie. Please. I want the pants and the sneakers. Lassie. Lass. Oh, crap. No, sir. Not while the spirit of Columbus ferments within me. After all, Columbus wore tights, too. So here goes out the window. <laughs> Back at Lodge Crest, we waited for Pete to arrive. 10.30 a.m. We got the canvas on the cotton blossom and the spinnaker stopped up. 10.50 a.m. and no Pete. If he failed me, I'd have to sail the blossom myself and make us all look silly. The mahogany speedboat was coming toward us. I shoved the cotton blossom slowly into the wind. The 10-minute gun. And then the mahogany launch swung alongside us and... There was Pete in the bows and his underwear and glasses. Pete! Pete, my boy! Stand away! I'm gonna jump! And a boy, Pete! Phew, there. Okay, boy. Thanks for the boat ride. Oh, Pete, you made it. You made it, boy. Yeah. Uh, and I I maybe killed my wife. How? I hit her. Yeah, I bopped her right on the schnoz. And she tried to stop me as I was crossing the yard to the garage, and I let her have it. Well, anyway, let me at that killer. He's all yours, Pete. Take over. Yes, but well, how does this Monty character start, Well, huh? he begins to reach away at about three minutes before the start. Yeah. And then comes back broad and hardens down and gets going. Oh, well, leave us get going, too. I feel reckless today. Let's go! The wind boomed into the Cotton Blossom's big sheet, and Pete got underway toward the starting line. Then... The gun! We're off! We closed for one of the prettiest races ever waged between Montauk Point and Staten Island. To this day, the encounter is known as the meeting of the long Balbriggan draws and the Snow White Polo Coat. Pete, for Pete's sake, you barely missed the fouling, boy. So we got through, didn't we? Snug in the weather, Bert. <laughs> what did Columbus have that I haven't got? Pants. Oh, you call them rompers pants? So all right, I haven't got pants, and Monty hasn't got a chance. They can't win. I will not have it. Huh. Hey, well, watch this way. You forgot how funny Pete Little looked in the cockpit of that racing yacht. A little husk of a man wearing shell-rimmed glasses and a sea-soaked union suit. Casper Milktoe snuck down to the leeward, watching the jib like the master that he was. You forgot how small and meek he was. You forgot the Balbriggan union suit. You forgot everything. Except that there was something heroic about that little man. Something timeless, something in the blood. Yes, as far back as Drake and Frobisher and Hawkins, and we have met the enemy and they are ours. Don't give up the ship and all that, all that. Of course, we won. Pete swept a spinnaker lifting and bow wave crooning across that finish line, and a gun welcomed the victor. Hello? Hello? Are they ringing, Pete? Hello, operator. The boys are waiting for you in the club room, Petey. Hello? Oh, oh, hello, Lassie. Uh, how, how are you? Oh, Peter, dear, are you all right? Oh, uh, question is, are you all right? Um, uh, is it broken? Is what broken? Your snot. I mean, your nose. Oh, no, dear. Are you coming home? Uh, no. No, I won the race, and I am not coming home. And what is more, I'm going to stay out all night. Well, have a good time, Peter. Ooh. Well, what? I want you to enjoy yourself, that's all. It's George Bemis there. Uh, yeah, he, he's here. Well, let me talk to him, will you please? She wants to talk to you. I'm dead. A wave washed me overboard. 
No, no, she, she's a different woman. Go on, talk to her. Uh, <clears throat> uh. Hello there, Mrs. Doolittle. George? George, you're Pete's friend. Uh-huh. Will you tell him for me that I want him to do anything he wants? Because, well, it's so hard for me to tell him this myself. But in my own way, believe me, I do love him. I really do, George. I, I'm sure you do, Mrs. Doolittle. I do want him to be happy. I didn't know this all meant so much to him. A little bit more, maybe. Tell him I want him to have fun. He'll believe you. Look, why don't you come down and join us, huh? May I? Uh, tell her to take a taxi, George. Pete wants you with him in his, in his hour of triumph. That sweet little man. Hey, hey, wait a minute, George. Give me that phone. She's tame, Petey. Hello, Lassie. Yes, dear? Lassie, why don't you wear that yachting dress I bought for you 25 years ago? Oh, Pete. Uh-huh. It's right back in style again. Just like you and me. You know, I think Mr. Rawlings must have enjoyed writing that story almost as much as we've enjoyed it tonight. And we were certainly lucky to have such fine players in our cast as Lois Corbett, who played Lassie Doolittle, Joseph Kearns, who was Pete, and Gerald Moore, who was George. In a moment, James Hilton will return to tell you about next week's story. Meantime, I'd like to remind you that there's nothing like one of those charming Hallmark dolls from the land of make-believe to make a child's eyes light up with joy. There are 16 dolls in all, Little Miss Muffet, Cinderella, Little Boy Blue, and 13 other childhood favorites. Each one wears a hat topped off by a jaunty plume that's a real feather. Each doll stands up by itself, and each one has a clever rhyme story about the doll inside. But that's not all. No, indeed. There's also a big, beautiful album to put them in. The Hallmark dolls are as easy to send as any Hallmark greeting card and cost only 25 cents each. And the big Hallmark doll collector's album, which you'd expect to cost at least a dollar, is also only 25 cents when you buy one or more of the Hallmark dolls. That means you can give some little friend of yours the album with three dolls in it to start a collection for only one dollar. See all 16 of the charming and colorful Hallmark dolls and the beautiful new Hallmark Doll Collector's Album tomorrow at the store where you buy your Hallmark greeting card. Now, here again is Mr. Hilton. Next week, we have a story which could truthfully be called a modern classic. It's The Citadel by A.J. Cronin, a great story about a doctor written by a doctor who became a great writer. And now let me take just a moment to remind you that there's a great shortage of nurses in our American hospitals and that a fine opportunity awaits young women between the ages of 17 and 35 who are high school or college graduates. You can apply to your nearest hospital or school of nursing. Thank you very much. And now, until next week, this is James Houghton saying good night. Tonight's story was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger. Our music was arranged and conducted by Lynn Murray. To be doubly sure of the finest quality, always look on the back of a greeting card for those three identifying words... A Hallmark card. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Next week, James Hilton's story selection for the Hallmark Playhouse is The Citadel by A.J. Cronin. And the week following, you will hear George Agnew Chamberlain's Phantom Philly. So until next Thursday, at the same time, this is Frank Goss saying good night to you all. This program came to you from the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri. Earl Smith and the news after this announcement.